Thank you very much, uh, David. It's just so great to be back out of the house uh, with a room full of uh, passionate photographers. And um, I think in figuring out what I was going to speak to today, it kind of uh, brought me back uh, to my roots and remembering kind of the, the joy of photography uh, that I felt. Uh, this isn't working. I'll just go to here. Um, there was a book called The Joy of Photography when I was uh, young, and it really did kind of capture uh, the feeling that I had when I was out there with my camera. And those of us that know, I mean, we're here, we're passionate photographers, understand what that feels like. It, it's such a blessing uh, to find photography and to have photography in our lives. And since it's been a rough couple of years, I wanted to kind of speak to the idea that that we're back, and we're out there, and it's safer to be out there, and we're pursuing our passion. So I thought I would uh, concentrate, and I have kind of a, a, a heavy lift in the sense that I wanted to talk really about uh, channeling our passion into more meaningful and satisfying pictures. So just a little bit of a background. I mean, I've been doing this a very long time. I was a little older than in this picture. Uh, the first camera that I got was, uh, as you can see there, was the Ashika TL-Electro X, which I saved my newspaper money to buy. And then I quickly upgraded to a Nikon FM, or Nikon FM, as it's properly pronounced. I've been a Nikon guy, Nikon guy, ever since. Uh, it's funny, we know that the camera is our tool to enable you know, what we're trying to capture and say about the world. but. The relationship with that tool is a little stronger, and there's a real kind of uh, strange kind of uh, loyalty to it. I think it's because of, the, of what this camera, what this tool has, has brought to my life, and I'm sure yours as well. Um, oh, sorry, there we go. Mm -hmm. Okay, I guess I can't use this. So these, these two pictures have had kind of a big impact early on with me. The first picture of the girl diving was taken really at a kind of noonday, bright sunny day. And when I developed the film, the Tri-X film, um, I realized that, wow, this picture was way better and much different than the actual experience. And it dawned on me that in photography, this incredible uh, literal medium that when you point your camera, you get this amazing resolution of whatever you point it at. You can also use it to sort of channel how you're feeling about the world or what you want to say about the world. And sometimes the reality is much different than what you're able to capture, even if it's just real life. And that was an important thing. And the other picture taken on a bus although it looks like a quiet moment, it really represents to me more of a bungee jump because when you're out doing travel and street photography, things are kind of out of your control. People aren't expecting pictures to be taken. So when you raise that camera up and you click, it literally, anything can happen. And I can tell you from all these years, um, all the stuff that's happened has been positive. I used to go to the roof of my apartment building almost every day with my camera. And I photograph sunsets. I photograph uh, planes coming into Pierre Elliott Trudeau International Airport, which is the local Montreal airport where I grew up. Uh, GAF 500 ASA ISO film, for those that, are, that remember, was the fastest film of the day. Of course, today, all bets are off. We've got it's the golden age. There's nothing we can't do with our tools. But I used to photograph these planes and wonder like, who these people are. And years later, I kind of made the connection that I think I, myself, was curious about them because I wanted to go see the world. And it was photography that has been my ticket. I'm essentially a shy person. I'm an introvert. I think a lot of photographers, kind of at the very base of things, are shy. When you're shy, you're an observer. And it's good kind of training for what's to come as a photographer. But I've followed my camera into all kinds of incredible experiences, as I'm sure you have. And it's really kind of brought me out of my shell into all these incredible engagements and encounters with the world. One point I wanted to make is, uh, apparently I'm aging. I don't really see it. I feel it. I don't really see it so much. But I wanted to give you the hypothesis that in the visual arts of all the arts, 
the best is yet to come. And I have this discussion with my cousin who manages a band. You know, you can look at the arc of an artist in music, for example, and Paul McCartney is about to turn 80. And he's done incredible work throughout his life. But if you've seen the Get Back documentary, which is incredible, um, you'll see them at the height of their powers. And I think in areas of creative pursuit like music, there's kind of an energy of youth combined with talents and 10,000 hours that produces the kind of work that is harder to replicate as you get older and learn more. But I think in the visual arts, both I mean, photography, of course, included. When I look at some of the heroes that I look up to, like Elliot Erwitt, who's 93, and you see work that he's done in his late 80s and go, wow, this is amazing. Or jo Joseph Kadelka, whose work I've, off I've always admired, just his sense of composition and order. Um, and he, he told a, a class once that, you know, and he's, what, 84 now, I photograph because I can. And when I get old and I can't move around so much, well, then I'm going to you know, go to the computer and start you know, pulling out stuff. And I see the work that he's done with panoramics. And I think it's like some of the strongest work I've seen. A mentor, Eugene Richards, you know, an incredible photographer that all photojournalists and documentary photographers at the time would look to and go, like, how does he do this? How does he get so close? How does he get not so much the physically close, but emotionally close enough to be able to take a picture like that? And he's 78 now. I can't believe it. But when I look at the recent work he's doing, it's as strong as anything I've seen. Because I've done a lot of work in Japan and doing workshops there, I've learned about Dato Moriyama, perhaps the most prolific street photographer out there. Each of those little icons represents a book. He's probably had more published books on photography than any other photographer. And you can look at some of the more recent work he's doing. Amazing. As good or better than anything he's done young. And you know, Jay Mizell, who I know a lot of New Yorkers know very well, now in his 90s, you can see a more recent work of his. All this to say that where I don't really see age. I don't know if anyone out there is over 30. But wherever you are, um, the best can be yet to come. Whatever your photographic goals and dreams might be, you can achieve them. It's just a question of going out there and doing it. And I have some ideas as to how we can make that happen. Um, when David Bowie passed, I remember seeing this quote. And I knew when I saw it that I wanted to share it. If you feel safe, you're, if you feel safe in the area you're working, you're not working in the right area. Always go a little further into the water than you feel you're capable of. Go a little bit out of your depth. When you don't feel your feet are quite touching the bottom, you're just about in the right place to make uh, something exciting. And from an innovative artist like David Bowie, you know, that's something to pay attention to. And as photographers, I try and keep this foremost in my mind when I'm out there, not taking safety risks, but just creative risks and trying new things. We know about the power of photography, and I just wanted to remind you that you know, what we're doing um, is rather unique, and maybe the time for still photography is now. I mean, the one thing that still photography does that no other medium does is with a fast shutter speed, you can freeze time. And we can't see it. We can't see those frozen moments. We can't watch it in a film. But in a still, we can see it. Harold Edgerton, the guy who developed our, our electronic flashes. Um, and that's one thing that photography does that nothing else does. So if you have sort of that frozen moment, it's immediately going to grab some attention because as humans, we don't see this. And the other thing, too, is we've heard of that cliche of the idea that a picture is worth a 1,000 words. And it's true. I mean, a 1,000 words can have a huge impact on you. It could make you laugh. It could make you cry. It could change your mind. Um, a video, a movie, perhaps has had an impact on your life. But all those things take time. But a still photo, in an instant, communicates so much. I mean, there's a 1,000 words or more sometimes in the strongest images. You don't understand everything. But nothing communicates as fast as a still image. And in a time now where everything is in competition for our attention and our attention spans are so small, still photography is kind of the way to get attention. So the idea of finding meaning in our work, this is a shot of my son, Sawyer. And I think you don't have to be a passionate photographer to understand the power and importance of photography. If 
If, God forbid, the house is burning, you save the living stuff, and then you go for the shoebox of pictures and negatives and the hard drives, because those things are absolutely irreplaceable. So Cartier-Bresson, who I think is one of the most influential photographers, particularly for street and travel people, um, has been very articulate, and I quote him a few times in this short presentation, and he said, photography is a way of shouting how you feel. And I think this is key to kind of understanding how to make things stronger in terms of your own photography is, how do you feel about the world that you go out and try and photograph? What is it you want to say? If you're a landscape person, maybe you want to share the beauty of the landscape that you see and feel and maybe, you know, have others feel that same way when they look at your pictures. So these are questions that I think are important for us to really kind of think about and really sort of plan as to what we're going to do. Because the good news is that the more personal you make your work, the more universal it becomes. Photography is a universal language. And this is a liberating thing. It was Dean Arbus pictured here in this Gary Winogrand shot that said something to the effect of this. And it's liberating. It means that you can be selfish. You can go out and say, hey, you know what? This is important to me. I'm going to spend some time documenting it. You are an artist. If that makes you uncomfortable, if you think it's pretentious, that's fine. But all that really signifies is that you want to share something personal about how you feel through photography. And the photography is going to do all the talking. I mean, you know, we know that photography is a time machine. You know, when I look at this picture of my grandparents, I didn't know them at this time. But of course, I knew them later in life. And, you know, I look at this picture and I can write a whole screenplay. It's amazing to me. And this, too, is the power of photography. If you want to see time, those of you that have kids, you know, my son Sawyer was two and a half pounds when he was born. He was a preemie. But you can see how quickly things progress and how time changes and how he changes with time. Meaningful and important. And there's a long history in photography of well-known photographers sharing their family album because those pictures can be affecting to those outside of the family. Again, the more personal you make it, the more universal it becomes. You don't have to be related to understand how something feels when you look at a photograph. And the best photographs do make you feel something. Even kind of the snapshot aesthetic, and I don't mean that in a negative sense, when you look at Nicholas Nixon's work where he photographed his wife and three sisters over the course of almost 50 years, it's amazing to look at. Why? Because you get to sort of see what time does. And you know, photography is the magic thing that freezes time. We're all aging, except David Brommer. And when we see these pictures, we can compare and understand you know, kind of what happens with the aging process. I love this quote, don't be so humble, you're not that great, uh, Golda Meir. And I put it in there to remind you that you, know, you have to, no matter how happy you are with where you're at photographically, um, I think you have to, again, the best is yet to come. There's a lot to learn, even if we've been doing this a very long time. Um, I think the idea of shooting different can be powerful. And I put this George Costanza picture in there because those Seinfeld fans might remember the episode where George did the opposite of his instinct and everything turned out really good. And as photographers, the idea of shooting different, because wherever you're at photographically, you go out, you come back, oh, this is good, this is, you know. But it's familiar to you. And unless you try something different, your work is going to kind of look the same. And you could add to your repertoire by trying something different, even if it's something that you don't really think is all that interesting. If you never shoot slow shutter speeds, go out and shoot slow shutter speeds and see what you get. See how it works. See how it fits in with the work that you're doing. If you tend to shoot you know, at the corner, F8, depth of field, go out one day and just shoot kind of wide open. Use selective focus and see how that works with your vision and what you're trying to do. I remember when I was in Japan, this frenetic city, and I'm photographing, and I was just not happy. So I decided I'm going to experiment with multiple exposures. And when I did, I thought, yeah, this, this is kind of how I felt when I was in Tokyo. This, express my feelings. Even though it's, it's something that I don't normally do, 
but it's worthwhile. So all these different ideas, like shooting from behind, if you're not a landscape person, you know, going out into the landscape, shooting at night, it's a whole other sort of magical situation when you take your camera out at night. And then, again, this quote, I think, is really important to me. It was by Gary Winogrand. He says, I photograph to see what things look like photographed. And those of you that may have taught workshops and are photo educators understand that you know, we all go to the same place, we come back, we review the work, and it's like, whoa, I was there, I saw that, I didn't really think to take a picture of, but somehow, when you translate that three-dimensional three situation into a two-dimensional photograph, it works. So in the digital age, I would encourage you to kind of take some pictures of things that you're, you know, don't think too much, just do, and see how it comes back. There may be something there. Okay, the technical side of photography. I will tell you that the technical side of photography is the area that tends to bog people down the most. But I maintain it's really the easiest thing to fix. There's a thousand other things in terms of what we do that are more important than the technical, but there's that minimum bar that you need to be at that you need to achieve so that your vision can come through. So, you know, the thing is, you gotta act, you gotta quick, and if you miss it, even if you're on a tripod in the landscape and you look away and the sun, you know, changes something, you've gotta have the reflexes of a sports photographer. So, I really feel that, you know, photography is like a battle between your left brain and your right brain. The left brain is sort of the scientist in you, it's dealing with the histograms and the f-stops and the shutter speeds. The right brain is where the fun and the action is, that's the creative side, but it's often hampered by, you know, the left brain stuff. So you have to kind of find that happy medium so that you can quickly react to the situation. So, and, and I think it's simplifying the process that is, is really the remedy that I have found in terms of kind of fixing some tech, technical issues. So when the tornado was coming at me, I was able to pick it up and I wasn't fumbling with, I was able to just get it and then get out. I think too that in photography, it's so many things, and I think that's probably why we have this passion for it. I mean, it's physical. We're out in the world. We're, we're, we're experiencing things. We're thinking about things. We're thinking of the scientist, the left brain, and then there's the whole creative side. You know, the odds are against us to get that strong picture, but we persevere because when we do, that's all the fuel we need to sort of continue on. I think, too, that, you know, there's maybe too much attention paid to the actual specs of the camera, Whereas at B&H, you can actually go and hold every camera and see how it feels. And that's important because in the end, you know, that camera is going to kind of disappear as much as possible so you're able to react quickly. I think it's important not to get lost in your camera. This camera is an easy camera to get lost in. It's the Z9. There's so much capability, but, you know, maybe, you know, we only use 10% of our brain. I'm not sure what that's all about. But we don't need to use all the stuff that's in there. We need to harness the most important parts of this tool so that we could, it can disappear and we can capture what it is that we want. So, you know, just from a technical perspective, my big five, back button autofocus, aperture priority, auto ISO, keeping it on continuous release so I can squeeze one at a time, but when the action heats up, I can do a burst. And I turn that image review off so it doesn't distract or seduce me into kind of leaving my concentration and admiring my work. I can always check in whenever I want. We don't have time to get into the technical. I'm happy to talk to you later about it. Uh, back button autofocus really changes everything. And uh, it's a simple tweak. And even if you're not a sports and action photographer where back button autofocus really shines, there's no downside to using back button autofocus regardless. Um, I choose aperture priority because I can quickly go to selective focus, add a little depth of field. And then auto ISO is powerful in the sense that I can set it to a minimum shutter speed that will cancel out any of my coffee drinking movement and give me sharp pictures, as well as capture a lot of you know, what's moving out there. Arguably, you know, the blur sometimes can help the picture. Maybe in this particular situation it can. Uh-oh. I'll freeze. Can you guys hear me?
Okay. So yeah, uh, oftentimes, you know, blur can be beautiful, and don't get me wrong, but in my experience as kind of a travel treat photographer, uh, sharpness is more important. So I could be an aperture priority, set a minimum shutter speed of 500th of a second, and essentially be in both sh aperture priority and shutter priority at the same time. And even if the ISO ramps up, these aren't our grandparents' ISO. You know, 2000s, the new 400. So the other thing that I would talk about is, especially when you're out in the world and things are out of our control, is shooting more of a volume of work. Um, you know, I'm citing these images. This is a famous picture by Deanne Arbus. And when you look at the contact sheet, you can see that the money shot was the last one on the roll. And if Ms. Arbus would have stopped at frame 11, she wouldn't have got this shot. So the idea of shooting more, the more you shoot, the luckier you get. Extending those shoots, spending more time, is a, a powerful one. I liken it to the idea of going up a roller coaster. You're going up, you're coming back, you're editing, you're learning, you're looking, and then you go out again, and you've learned a little, and you make things a little bit better. And these experiences of shooting more and shooting a volume of work, again, get into your muscle memory, a little bit different from the technical muscle memory, but it fast tracks you to the better places to stand and be and understand uh, in terms of what you're doing. And as you put in that 10,000 hours as you're going up this, this uh, roller coaster, there is a tipping point that happens, and then suddenly you're in that same vehicle, but your experience is a lot different. And this is a bit of a magical kind of transition that I'm sure has happened to you guys already wherever you're at, but it continues. The best is yet to come. It never has to end. And the idea of the volume helps you in, term, in terms of you know, getting that sort of decisive moment. The difference between you know, not much to a keeper is really that split second. And shooting the volume will teach you to just unconsciously be able to get that. And it's not a question of a fast frame rate. It's a question of you triggering at the right time. You know, oftentimes I've learned that the off moment is the moment. So my instinct says now, but really it was before the now. So I learned to kind of trigger before, depending on what you're shooting. The volume will help to reveal whatever that mystery style is. And you know, don't worry about that, because you can't even see it. What you do with your camera oftentimes is just so organic to you that you can't really see the connection in the images that you make that maybe defines your style. But the more you shoot, the more it's revealed. And it's much easier for me to see the style that you have than it is for you yourself, which is why we all need help when it comes to eventually evaluating our images. And you know, help is on the way up in the portfolio review room. I'll be there later. Come see me. I'm happy to look at your work. And there's all these incredible speakers that are there to help articulate what they're seeing in your work. Hugely powerful in terms of self-awareness, in terms of what you're doing. So you should really take advantage of it. So just working is the way to do it. And the idea of working it, and that is shoot a volume of work, but when possible, whatever attracts you to the situation, that first picture is the starting point. From there, you move on and you give yourself options. And the more you work, but it doesn't feel like work because we love what we're doing here, the more options we have. And you want it to be difficult when you're going through. I mean, that's the one th price you have to pay, editing. You know, which one? And I'll talk about that in a little bit. So this idea of volume, it may be just a little bit of a change, because you know any kind of movement, everything within the frame starts to change. And at first, you may not see everything. And you'll never see everything in the frame. But with this volume, eventually, you'll just kind of be able to. It's, it's a bit magical, but you're going to start to react faster and compose better as you continue to do this. You learn that if you bend down, putting someone above the horizon line, oftentimes it's a better way to go. And it also helps to boldly find your position. And look, I mentioned at the start, I'm kind of a shy person. But I know that sometimes I need to be bold and go up and get in close if that's what it takes to make a stronger image. I don't want to you know, startle anyone. I don't want to scare anyone. But you do what you got to do to get those pictures. And that's the power of our passion if we let it. So you know, this is what's going to happen. It's going to get you in close so that you're able to do this. And then there's the idea of you know, going to where there's visual potential. And you know, David at the outset mentioned this whole idea of the zone. 
And I think you should see that. It's recorded. But I feel the same way. There is that photographic zone. You know, when you go out for a photo walk with people, I mean, that's a kind of a different experience. You're talking in the same language with other photographers. You're learning from each other. But to do your best work, you really have to be the lone wolf. You have to, it's a lonely pursuit. Meet up later and talk about it and show. But in order to do your best work, you have to kind of be on your own so that you can try and find your way into that zone where everything disappears and you're in total concentration, shooting, working, moving. And you're gonna, it's going to pay div dividends. I'm not patient at all. But in photography, I know that patience pays off. So I learned to be patient when I'm out there. I've learned that spending more time in fewer places equals better pictures. I think Einstein came up with that equation initially. But it really does work. So I go to places or situations that I think have potential. And I wait. And I spend time. And the longer you spend, the more you tend to realize. I mean, sometimes you're there, and you get sort of a worker bee image. But if you wait and you're patient, Something happens. It's real, it's authentic, and it's better, and it adds a couple of stars to the picture. It doesn't happen often enough, but that's just the numbers game. You've got to keep doing it. So the idea of being patient is really important, and persevering. And look, we're persevering. I mean, the pandemic hopefully is behind us to a large extent, and we're going to be out there again, and we're going to have more freedom. Um, persevering, you know, just keep going. So when I was on uh, 57th and 5th, you know, I'd rather stay in one place. And I would. I would stay there. I'd sort of preset my camera. And then I'd just shoot and see what happens. You never know what's going to happen. And then this happened. I, I didn't even see it until I edited it. But as a street photographer, I thought, oh, this is a great picture. I, wanna... I used it on my business card for a while. This guy has no idea that by doing this, uh, he made himself famous or mini famous. Um, <clears throat> So the idea of staying in one place. And while I'm here, I just wanted to mention to you briefly that it's easy to sort of talk yourself out of things. And the idea of getting out of your comfort zone, I will tell you that taking pictures is absolutely legal. And it's generally legal around the world. Even in places like Germany that have very, very strict privacy laws, you can go out, you can take a picture of someone without their permission, you can make a print. You can put it on your art book. You can put it in a photo gallery. You can put it on your website. You can sell that print for $1,000. And the person whose, whose image that is can sue you. And they have lost repeatedly, because when they are. So legally, in the United States, in New York in particular, there have been a, a few lawsuits. So don't worry about that. And you're not out to do anything bad. I mean, you can shoot. Children? I mean, these are ethical things. But from a legal standpoint, there's really nothing we can't do. So just shoot it, although maybe I can get sued for this. But the idea of just shooting it, I think, is, is really, really important. Just get out there and shoot it and persevere. And then to sort of transition here, the idea of a set of pictures. I think that whoever you are, um, the idea of creating a set of pictures. So if you're a landscape photographer, when you go out and you, you kind of spread out the pictures that you've been taking, sometimes you realize, I'm kind of taking the same picture over and over again. And the idea of creating a set of pictures with some sort of beginning, middle, and end, and that's not the traditional beginning, middle, and end, but to tell kind of a story can be a whole new learning curve. And it will force you to sort of try new stuff. Don't worry about the idea that it's been done. It's all been done. And again, Cartier Russell said, there are no new ideas. There's just kind of re-examining. And you're going to do it differently. And your, your project uh, on Coney Island is going to be different from Harvey Stein, whose project uh, is a book. And he'll be talking a little bit later. So it's OK. You know, why do photographers go to Coney Island? Because it's very visual. There's a lot of visual potential there. For 100 years, they've been going making amazing pictures. And there's 100 more years of great pictures to be had. The idea of the sum is greater than the parts. You just have to look to the work of Chuck Close, who since the 70s was painting. You can see those little individual paintings or pixels. When you stand back, the sum is greater than the parts. And this is what happens when you put together a set of, of pictures. The challenge becomes each picture has to be strong, but then you sequence it in a way that kind of makes sense. You have to find something that makes sense for you in terms something that's personal to you, that's meaningful to you. Find that theme. Or whatever it is that you, maybe it's the portfolio. Just choosing your best 20 pictures is not easy, and you're going to need help to do that. But the idea of putting together 
a set of pictures, in my experience, you know, forces you to dig deeper. You peel the onion. It takes you to places that you've never been photographically. Um, it allows you to make a stronger connection, tell a deeper story. And it separates you from the 95 million pictures that are being uploaded to Instagram every day. Um, most of those pictures will be forgotten, but as passionate photographers, we have the advantage. We can harness the power of photography that we all know exists and make something personal and amazing. And maybe not everyone's going to love it, but a lot of people respond to it because it is you know, that, that, that uh, universal language and just a reminder you know, of what it is you're going to do. That style and visual voice that you have that you may not even see yourself, but others can, will be magnified because you're concentrating your efforts. And you know, it's nice to go out serendipitously and not know what you're going to have, but when you know what you're looking for, it's easier to find. And when you're working on a project, you know what you have, and you know what you need to try and add to it. So you know, Chuck Close said that inspiration is for amateurs. The rest of us just show up and get to work. And, um, you know, Picasso, who, you know, in his later years did some amazing work. Again, the best is yet to come. It's the working thing. There's no substitute for it. And I will tell you that, in my experience, all the projects that I've done, and I've always got a project on the go, um, have not only been satisfying, but, you know, I've met some of the most amazing people that are still in my life because of it. And again, that's the joy of photography, being able to go out and experience things. You know, the camera is my ticket. The camera takes me to these places that I have no business being. But it gives me the bravado to go out there and explore you know, what it is that I would never explore kind of without, without a camera. Again, Cartier-Bresson says, everything's interesting if you scratch it, if you go below the surface a little bit, which is harder to do. But if you have an idea, you can do it. And when you go out and you come back, you see what you got, you can go out and you can make it a little bit better. And you'll see that pictures you thought were great get replaced by even better pictures. In art, we understand the power of personal passion. We know it when we see it, and the viewer will feel it. And that's what it's all about. So the last part, which I think is really important that I wanted to mention, is the editing. And by editing, I mean sort of the choosing of your work. And here's the thing. You need help. We all need help. It doesn't matter if you're Ansel Adams or David Brommer. Uh, we need help because we're so close to the work that it's hard for us to really, you know, we know it so well that we can't even see it anymore. Um, there's a guy who I've looked to, you know, he was first on the internet, Mike Johnston, the online photographer. And he described a situation where one of his clients sent him 850 shots and he brought it back. He looked at it and he thought, okay, there's some gems here. So he went through the 80, 850 and maybe narrowed it down to like 20, you know, real gems. And as an exercise, he asked that photographer to cull it down. Give me like 40 of the, the best from the 850. When he received the 40, none of the pictures that Mike Johnson thought were the best of this guy's work were there. And this is the red flag. And this is what I wanted to warn you about. This is why we don't want to delete pictures. Because two years from now, with more sophisticated eyes, you go back and you see things that maybe you overlooked. This is dangerous, which is why we want to have someone, be it, be it the camera club person, the friend, the mentor, someone who can articulate photography, or in the portfolio room up above. The good news is, you're the best editor of your work, because nobody cares more. But you're also the worst editor in many ways, because the emotional metadata that sticks to the image when you see it can change the way you're thinking and make it a little difficult for you to be truly objective. That's why leaving it, giving it time, coming back in six months and looking at it. And digital, we got it right away, so we see right away. And it's dangerous, so just be warned. Don't delete anything. Um, and ultimately, in order to sort of you know, narrow down our family and get rid of some of our babies, we need help. You know, Tony Bennett said, you know, this is, he's well over 90 now, um, but Fred Astaire taught him it's, it's not what you put in, it's what you leave out of a performance. When the show is perfect, every song works, no matter how perfect it is, go in and pull out 15 minutes of it. Don't stay on stage too much. Enough is enough, less is more. It's the right thing to do. Hard to do that. I'm guilty of it myself. You know, on my website, I have way too many pictures on various projects. 
but it's important to sort of get that help and distill it down because that gives you the bar at which you're aiming at. Your best stuff is here, so you go out shooting, you look, oh, this is pretty good, but is it as good as this? Hmm, I gotta keep going out because you want to, and the, the more you shoot, the better you get, the more satisfying the pictures are to you, and the better they are. Um, one last thing, the criteria solution is something that I've used because I don't always have the help around me. And, you know, the best pictures just edit themselves. They jump out of the computer and, you know, they're five star. But oftentimes, this is kind of where you're at. You've got a bunch of images that are very close. And how do you choose between those? Well, there's different criteria that you can use, you know, to pull out the very best of an image. And one of them is sort of the main and secondary. You know, when I look at this image, the main subject, of course, is this woman who takes care of all these orphans in Lesotho. And I was looking for the picture that best expressed her. There were other images where the secondary part of the kids was not quite as uh, good, like here, some of them, their eyes are closed. But it was the main subject that pushed them over the edge. You know, the main subject is the dancer, and the secondary subject is the, the bouquet and the out-of-focus dancers. So I may like the bouquet on the bottom left of the out-of-focus. It's a little less awkward, but it's the main one that I'm concerned with. And that will help you to kind of decide. And there's different criteria that you can use. Um, there's a lot that can be gleaned. I'm just going through fit. My time is almost up. I think that you want to, especially when you're doing a set of picture, the flow of living within the discipline of the aspect ratio is good, so it's not like square, rectangle, so on and so forth. For those one-offs, I think it's good. Cropping is our second chance. I mean, I just want to get it in focus, keep it a little loose, and then I'll come in, I'll keep the same aspect ratio, and I'll try and make the picture as strong as I can. I think that more megapixels equals more possibilities, because you can take a small part of the frame and blow it up. Can't have too many megapixels, as far as I'm concerned, or too much money. Um, and then there's the idea of black and white. You know, sometimes black and white is a better way to express. And sometimes we ignore it, because we're always sort of shooting color. In the old days of film, you had to commit to black and white film, but now we don't have that committal. So again, the joy of photography, we all understand it. We got to take some chances. We got to break through our comfort zone. I think you want to shoot, make it personal, shoot what you know. You want to be patient. You have to persevere and not give up. And you will find the joy in more meaningful images, even if those images are not necessarily joyous in terms of what it is that you're photographing, but you want to take the leap. I think the journey is the destination. And the destination we want to get to at some points is that five-star image. So I think that's it. I got all I wanted to say here. Photoeducate.com is my website where I'm doing all these workshops. I have a couple coming up, one in London and one in Rome in July and August. So come join me, and a lot of other ones there. And if you have questions, you can email me. And we're going to be up there in the portfolio uh, review room. Take advantage of that opportunity, even if you don't have everything all together. Get up there and, and see as many people as you can. That's it. Thank wow. You. Wow, that was, uh, I, I agree with everything you said. I have to say, that's the... Each other's sentences. That's some, yeah, that's, that's it. That's when I grow up. I want to be Steve Simon, photographer. <laughs> I mean, it packs up the work with, with the technique and whatnot. It's amazing. That, that's really, you nailed it. And we love that. Thank you, Steve. I always knew you had it in you. <laughs> Not to mention, you also used my name and Ansel Adams in the same sentence. That which is, is true. Pretty, that is that's true. That's like, that's, you, you get a bonus for that. Okay. Um, you want to, uh, do we have our, our Q&A staff around? Where's our, mm. would, would you guys want to take a, a, some questions to Steve? I'm oh, just updating a quick on. presentation for Jess. So if, uh, Yana, if you raise your hand, if you have a question for Steve, Yana will uh, grab a, oh, I see. Have a microphone for you. No questions for Steve? No questions. That's impossible. Oh, there's one, maybe. Maybe not. <laughs> okay. All right, we don't like dead air. Steve, do you know how to dance? Uh, like Wait. Elaine in Seinfeld. <laughs> oh my God, it's the worst. <laughs> it's the worst. <laughs> oh, there's a question over there. Go ahead. 
Ah, OK. Well, I mean, I could get it to you. We can't get it to you right now. But essentially, he says, you use the analogy of going into the water. Go into the water a little further than when your feet aren't quite touching the ground and you're not sure and the current's moving. That's the time when you're going to, something great is going to happen creatively, photographically. So it's really being in a place that, oh, you've never been. It's new. And you know, the familiar is great. And you, know, you have a certain ability that you've accumulated. But getting sort of over your head creatively is kind of where the learning curve comes in. And you want to seek that out as much as possible, I think, you know, as hard as it is. When do you feel that you have to get out of the box? When do you feel you have to get out of that box that you're normally shooting too much of one thing and need to change to go to something else? Yeah. Well, again, as mentioned, oh, thank you, the idea of, um, you know, trying new things, I think, is always a good idea because when you do, not always will it work out, not always will you feel that this is the direction you want to go. But, you know, if you're, if you're doing something in a way that is very satisfying and you're working on your work and you're really happy with it, that's all good. But maybe, well, maybe the next step is to, you know, put a little gallery show together, even if it's in your own living room. But then when you get out of your comfort zone, you may decide, hey, there's that local coffee shop that you know, shows pictures, maybe I'm going to approach them, and maybe I can put them out there. Um, you're not going to get rich with photography. The best way to make a million dollars in photography is to start with two million. But, uh, you know, that's not what it's about. You know, it's about the passion. It's about the passion. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think that, um, you know, the... I would say the 35 millimeter focal length, that's what the favorite lens for street shooting is. I think the 35 millimeter focal length is a nice cross between wide and very little distortion. And when you're able to get up close, the physical proximity to your subject matter um, makes for more intimate photography. It's more difficult to do. Everything's out of our control. So the wider you shoot, the harder it is to get those images. But when you do, there's an impact with that 35 millimeter when you're physically close and you're close in enough that the viewer will feel in a different way than what a telephoto lens will, will provide. So I think that would be it. But I have a 24 to 105 now. That's cheating. But I, I, will, I will keep it on 35, and then I'll zoom with my feet a little bit. I think that's a better way to go when it comes to zoom lenses. Yeah, it's kind of like yeah. Of course. Yes. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. Uh, you know, you're a genius. Every picture you take is a masterpiece. And all your friends and your wife and your, your mom, you know, loves what you do. But I think, you know, the first way to do that is to kind of, you know, see within the photographic community if there's someone there that can articulate something useful for you. It's not always easy, but you can find this online. I wouldn't use Instagram as a judge because likes, art is not a democracy. It is true that the best pictures tend to rise to the top, but you could be sort of misled into, this picture had a lot of likes, this picture of the cats, even though I'm doing this, you know, it's not about that. What you really want is to go to the portfolio room and hear people talk about your pictures and say, you know, if, if it's a masterpiece, why it's a masterpiece. And if it isn't, and you think it is, they'll explain why. And that's something you can use and maybe make you see things in your own work that you hadn't seen before. And that's extremely valuable. How you find them, you can call me. I know you, so you can call me. But, but yeah, it's really important to find you know, within camera clubs, within community. The BH, b &H community is amazing for that. So, OK.